No parent ever wants to face the reality that their child might have a mental illness. But the truth is that somewhere between 13 to 20 percent of kids aged 3 to 17 experienced a mental disorder in a given year. It's an important public health issue that must be addressed. Joining me now are Dr. Victor Fernari, Director of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Zucker Hillside Hospital, and Janet Susson, President of the National Alliance on Mental Illness for Queens and Nassau Counties in New York. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pleasure us. to be here. Janet, I have to start with you. Can you tell me a little bit about the a National Alliance for Mental Illness? The National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, um, is a grassroots organization, actually the largest a grassroots mental health organization in the country, and we're committed to making a better world for all those affected by mental illness. And we do that through raising awareness and support and education, and all of which is free. <laughs> and we also advocate uh, on issues of concern uh, to people with mental illness and their families. Your connection to this cause is really a personal one. That's true. Can you tell me a little bit about your story? Sure, sure. Um, I have a son who developed schizophrenia. Uh, I should say was diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 16. But in truth, you know, I, I certainly saw symptoms well before that. And, and for our son, it was really a slow slide into schizophrenia. Probably symptoms were there to be seen even, you know, when he was in elementary school, but clearly by middle school. And um, one of the things that was so frustrating to me, actually, was getting people to be willing to give our son a diagnosis. We were actually far more open about it than the people that tested him. He was tested in eighth grade, and he was tested when he was uh, 15 and a half, wow. just a couple months before he had a psychotic break. So uh, I'm very much into, uh, along with Dr. Fenari, about the importance of raising awareness and actually, you know, leveling with parents. I think that's awfully important. Is this typical, Dr. Fenari? Is Janet's story with her son a typical scenario that it's difficult to, to get a diagnosis? And what age do symptoms usually start? Well, I think it depends on what the mental illness is. So for some of the more serious mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, often there is a period of time prior to the onset of the full syndrome that we call the prodrome. And the prodromal period can be for several years, but during that period of time, the diagnosis has not declared itself. And so oftentimes there's a change in functioning, mm -hmm. a deterioration, perhaps social withdrawal, mm -hmm. or some academic decline, but mm -hmm. not enough concrete symptoms to declare it. And that makes it more difficult. The parents can feel it and know it, but mm -hmm. the doctor can't mm -hmm. make the diagnosis. Right, but today we have a much greater awareness about the prodrome. In fact, we're even trying to introduce that prodromal period as a diagnostic entity because we know that it really does represent a critical period where if you can intervene, we believe you can actually prevent the development from the full disorder in many situations. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those identifiers <coughs> that happen early on? Well, we, we believe that if parents notice a change in functioning, social withdrawal, recent academic decline, mm -hmm. that it merits a consultation because those are such serious changes in functioning for youth because after all a child's work is school mm -hmm. and their relationships with their friends is really the litmus test of how they're doing socially. Mm -hmm. So if there's a social withdrawal or an academic decline, the question is what's going on? And often we can then identify this as a prodromal phase and recommend the appropriate education and treatment to try to avert the development of the full disorder. Yes, and I just have to say, I mean, I was, this goes back many years, and I'm so happy to hear what Dr. Fenari is saying, but I mean, I was extremely fortunate in that eventually, uh, you know, we found our way to Zucker Hillside, and they absolutely recognized what was going on and were more than happy to call a spade a spade. And that was an enormously uh, 
welcoming, and it just made really all the difference. Um, and I do want to say, I feel very good to be able to say this, um, by 19, our son was on a medication which made all the difference in the world, and he's now 44, wow. he hasn't been in the hospital since. So I've just always been enormously grateful uh, for um, for the correct diagnosis and for the wonderful research that they're doing, you know, in um, recognizing the prodromal symptoms and getting help for people early on. We think, uh, as a mom, I'm a mom, mm -hmm. you think as a mother, this diagnosis would be so hard to mm -hmm. manage, mm -hmm. but it sounds like in your situation, you knew something was wrong. Absolutely. So that diagnosis it was a relief, yeah. was an enormous relief. Um, it just made all the difference in the world. You know, I was tired of hearing things like, get a tutor, <laughs> you right. know. Right. Um, so yes, yes, and uh, perhaps we were more ready to right. accept the diagnosis than most, but it does make all the difference. I'm sure that that doesn't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So when you have to give a parent a diagnosis that their child does have a mental illness, how do you get the parents to accept it? And I think early intervention and really bringing that up probably helps, but what do you do to, to tell a parent there is something you can do, but this is, something is wrong with your child? Right. So first of all, once families come for consultation, that's already 90% of the work because they've already had the awareness the courage, the determination to seek a consultation. And even if they're not ready to hear difficult news, they're there. Right. The difficulty is that probably 50% of the families whose child has a mental illness don't seek treatment. And so the difficulty then is that oftentimes the mental illness unfolds, is untreated, and there's a great deal of difficulty in terms of poor functioning. But once the family does come, I think part of our job is to establish rapport, to try to understand when they're, what they're ready to hear, what they're not ready to hear, mm -hmm. and really work with them to educate them and to recognize that this isn't going to be a one visit hello, that over time try to educate them to what we think is going on and what we recommend. What are the early treatment options that you do offer, can offer? Right, so there's a variety of treatment options. Some of them are already evidence-based and others are still in investigation as part of research protocols. And so depending upon what the circumstance is, we might offer them a medication trial, we might offer them education for the family, uh, it could be group therapy for the young people, it might be group for the parents. Mm -hmm. Usually we'll refer them to NAMI because we want them to be educated. Uh, and for some youngsters, uh, if there isn't an evidence-based treatment that's already available, we'll try to enroll them into a protocol that we believe they might benefit from uh, based on their symptoms. I think one of the issues that we should bring up is really when we turn on the news, that there have been tragic mass casualty events, and we've seen that sometimes mental illness is behind this. And so this has really become a public health issue, an awareness that we all have to have. Mm -hmm. And that early intervention and early awareness, diagnosis, treatment that all of us need to get on board in having this conversation and be educated mm -hmm. is important because of what we're seeing going on. I just want your thoughts on that. Well, you know, first of all, I mean, I have to say, you know, that the vast majority of people with mental illness are not violent. And that when, and when a horrifying act occurs, and we can all <laughs> tick those off in our brain, you know, it may be a failure, really, of the system or what we would call the system here, failure, failure to get adequate and appropriate treatment. Or it may even be, you know, I've certainly heard of instances where people were in treatment and de or desperately searching for treatment. And so we, we want to make sure that we, we, we're, we're not blaming families for not, you know, making sure that their loved one got treatment. It, it is, you know, difficult, difficult situation. And, and we certainly, would like to believe that it, there's, if people are engaged in treatment, there's a less likelihood for, for these horrible acts to occur. 
Well, I certainly want to uh, second that, that the reality is, is that if anywhere uh, from one, to five, one in five children meet criteria for a diagnosis before the age of 18, the vast majority are nonviolent. Mm -hmm. The difficulty, I think, is that our society is struggling with access to weapons. And I think that if we had to face uh, boldly in the, in the eyes what we believe a challenge would be, would be to limit access to firearms. Amen to that. Certainly. I, I think that is a very good point to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly taking away the stigmata of mental illness mm -hmm. and that education piece. And I know you're bringing that into the schools yes. with breaking the mm -hmm. silence. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that program. Sure. Um, we have a school education project that was started uh, <clears throat> way back in the, in the late 80s. Actually, I was the one who started it because I was so amazed to learn that uh, kids in our son's school didn't learn anything about mental illness. So um, we have lessons for upper elementary, middle school, and high school. They're story-based, they're games, there's posters, role plays, and they were intended for teachers who know nothing at all about mental illness and to make it easy for them to do it. And I'm happy to say that uh, there are schools all over the, and districts all over the country that use our lessons. We even get orders uh, from outside the country and our lessons have been translated into just Spanish and, and wow. Greek because of advocates outside the country that feel the same way as we do. I mean, this is a, a national issue but it's also a worldwide issue. Is that the one message that you would want parents, teachers, friends to know about mental illness? Well, I mean, the main message I want people to get is that these are, you know, certainly biologically bra based brain disorders. And it's important for everybody to recognize the signs and symptoms. And often it's a friend who may recognize that there's a change. And you were mentioning some things, you know, change in sociability. So that it's important for everyone to understand, not only the individual, but those who uh, he, he or she comes in contact with. So yes, uh, I, I know that we all would like to see everyone learn about mental illness illness in the schools, however they do it. And we encourage peers uh, not to feel as though they're obliged to maintain confidences, but quite the contrary, when they're worried about mm -hmm. a friend, tell the parents. And this is a key mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. If a parent, if a child, if anyone suspects that a child has some symptoms of mental illness, what do you tell them to do? We recommend that you tell someone, you tell mm -hmm. a trusted friend, a teacher, a coach, Absolutely. Uh, a religious leader, someone who you trust that you're worried about someone because that information should not be kept private. Mm -hmm. Today's discussion is such an important topic. I think the key takeaway here is that parents and children shouldn't feel shameful or like they need to hide from mental illness. The more we talk about it, the better we can address the situation and get help for our kids and loved ones. This issue affects all of us. Janet, Dr. Feneri, thank you so much for being here.